applications. So yeah, and uh, so on the one hand, I would like to make them easy to use. So I work on programming models, uh, basically provide in, uh, abstractions, high level abstractions for programmers so that they can uh, more conveniently uh, program uh, you know, different systems we build. On the other hand, I would like to make them easy to manage. So I work on resource management so that you know, we, we can uh, uh, use the resources in the systems in a more efficient way. Uh, and uh, today's lecture, uh, we are going to cover uh, quite some topics. Most of them are quite basic. And then at the end, I will give, of course, some advanced topics as well. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to understand, uh, uh, first get an overview of the evolution of edge computing. And then uh, you should be able to learn how to design efficient edge AI systems for video analytics, which is one of the killer application you know, for edge computing. And at the end, you should be able to craft a vision for general purpose edge computing and how we can achieve uh, that vision. So we are living in a world full of uh, mobile ubiquitous applications, right? Uh, supported by all kinds of uh, you know, smart devices like smartphones, uh, augmented reality glasses, uh, different kinds of sensors, whatever. So we have seen uh, applications like smart cities, augmented reality, you know, autonomous cars, and also smart manufacturing. And all those different applications are sort of powered by the rapid uh, development of three different things. So the first thing is about computing. So in the past uh, decade or two decades, actually, cloud computing has uh, evolved into the dominant computing paradigm for, you know, for our applications, right? So we, we can get uh, almost the infinite amount of resources on demand from the big centralized data centers. And nowadays, of course, those uh, cloud data centers uh, are equipped with uh, different types of accelerators to accelerate uh, you know, different kinds of applications. And the second uh, uh, big uh, development is on wireless communication. So we have seen like the widespread uh, adoption of uh, or the deployment of 5G uh, networks. And also people are working on 6G networks or even beyond. And also we have seen uh, new standards for Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, you know, uh, uh, networking uh, technologies that can make our connection more, uh, you know, higher bandwidth and also lower power consumption. Uh, last but not the least, we have seen uh, a big uh, sort of a breakthrough uh, in artificial intelligence where we have seen a lot of uh, uh, modern applications powered by deep learning technologies, and those can actually outperform uh, human uh, experts uh, in many of the uh, inference tasks, for instance, uh, face recognition or object detection, so on and so forth. Uh, and this trend, of, of course, is backed up by, you know, the uh, market, general market growth of uh, the smart devices uh, we, we have seen. So in general, we can see that in the past uh, six years, uh, the number of connected devices on the internet uh, has, grow, has grown uh, by four times. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we look uh, into the categories, we will see that IoT devices actually uh, are the dominant factor here. And uh, if we dive into the uh, IoT market growth, uh, we will see that in the past uh, six years, we have seen 2.5 times uh, growth of the, of the market size. So all these things bring new challenges, of course, right? And uh, we need somehow to deal with uh, those challenges. So in particular, uh, those applications actually impose uh, new types of demands and requirements for the computing general computing support. And in particular, we have seen the following four, you know, types of uh, requirements, sort of, I mean, not necessarily new all of them, but, uh, you know, some of them, the combination of those would be uh, some of new uh, nowadays. So the first uh, is uh, we have seen much increased the data volume. So, you know, different kinds of sensors, they generate uh, a lot of data 
like a video audio streams or sensor data, lighter uh, stream data. And we have seen much increased the computational complexity as well because of the modern learning techniques applied to this big data, right? And uh, for some of the applications, especially those uh, user interactive ones like augmented reality and uh, autonomous driving probably also falls into this category. Like we have bounded latency requirements. And this is a really important for, for those applications. And finally, we have seen a growing, the growing importance of mission critical applications and uh, you know, applications uh, that are concerned with uh, safety, reliability, and uh, security. So yeah, all these things uh, actually uh, complicate uh, the, our, the, com the com computing infrastructure design for those modern applications. And uh, if we look at the current computing landscape, basically we see two extremes here. Uh, the first category is called on-device computing. So we have different types of devices. Somehow they are embedded with some computing power there and we can do the computation locally on those devices, right? Of course, uh, this would provide the benefits of a low latency uh, because almost uh, uh, no network bottleneck uh, with the on-device computing. Uh, and also it provides higher reliability uh, because of, of the, you know, the uh, uh, lack of network involvement there. But on the other hand, you know, it is very hard to run the uh, state-of-the-art uh, deep learning models on those devices because of uh, physical limitations, like they have uh, limited computing power and uh, also the battery life of those devices is generally limited. Uh, so we will uh, talk about that more later, but uh, yeah. So basically, if we want to run like deep learning uh, models on those devices, we have to apply some sort of optimization there, like uh, compression, uh, proning, or quantization. And uh, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of uh, people working in this domain, and there are actually lectures uh, later today or tomorrow that will talk about uh, this, those directions. So on the other hand, we have cloud computing, of course. So with the uh, cloud, abandoned cloud resources, actually we can run the state of art uh, deep learning models with accelerators. Uh, and then we can achieve very high service quality, but uh, uh, actually, you know, the, the data that we are talking about uh, is usually generated by the end devices uh, at the edge of the network. And then, if we want to do all the processing in the cloud, then we need to stream the data all the way through the internet to the cloud. So that would mean that we need a lot of uh, bandwidth consumption there, especially in the core network. This could be easily uh, bottlenecked if we all, all the applications from end devices you know, stream the data to the cloud. And uh, of course, uh, a more important problem here is about latency. So. Basically, if we cross the internet, then the latency is gener generally high and also um, it is generally uncertain. So you cannot really guarantee what kind of latency you can, you can expect from there. So this is a very sort of dis disastrous for many of the ab applications we are talking about. And uh, so that's basically the motivation behind uh, you know, uh, a recent uh, trend which is called a modern distributed computing continuum. And uh, so the basic idea is that, uh, you know, uh, we have the cloud computing, we have on-device computing, and uh, what about uh, something in the middle, right? So basically uh, the idea is to introduce yet another layer called edge layer. So we can deploy some computing resources like collocated with uh, the access points or the cellular uh, towers, whatever. Uh, and then we can offload some of the computations from the cloud or from the end devices onto those computing resources uh, in, in the middle. So this way uh, we can actually cover a wide range of trade-offs between latency and service quality. So basically if we go this direction, we have more resources, we have higher service quality, but then latency is higher. 
But if we move this direction, we have a lower latency, but uh, also lower service quality. So the edge layer basically fills the, the gap between the two extremes and provide a sort of a wide spec spectrum for, for your system design. And uh, before we move on you know, to, to the major content of today's lecture, I would like to clarify a little bit what do we mean by edge. And uh, in different research communities, actually people refer to edge by different things, right? And uh, we certainly don't want to, you know, to start uh, this sort of uh, religious war of, uh, you know, how we can define edge. Uh, so basically here we have, uh, you know, probably edge servers or even data centers that are deployed at the edge of the network. Uh, those are deployed. Those are things uh, like deployed on purpose to support uh, uh, low latency applications, or some of the uh, you know work covers that uh, you know we can use network devices, uh, routers, or switches to do some uh, uh, processing inside the network. On the other hand, of course, we have the mobile device and IoT devices. So we can, you know, those are tailored for specific use cases. Of course, uh, you know, we can use these devices to do uh, efficient computation, or whatever. So, you know, in general, we can call all those things uh, edge computing or edge in general. But uh, in this lecture, we are gonna focus on the edge infrastructure, and uh, we treat uh, the the other devices like mobile IoT devices as uh, end devices. But of course, you know, uh, some people call these uh, edge devices. It's, it's also totally fine. Just uh, you know, to clarify a little bit uh, in, in the scope of this uh, lecture, we have this uh, sort of uh, separation. And uh, this is today's agenda. So uh, first I will uh, go through the history and the motivation behind edge computing, also a little bit the evolution of edge computing. So why, where, where we started uh, this, this kind of things. And uh, in particular, I will talk about uh, mobile computation of loading. So with, which, which was heavily started like 10 years ago. And uh, I will explain the major designs there and why, you know, also why uh, it didn't fly, what, are, what was the problems. And then I will move on to uh, usually so-called killer application for edge computing, uh, deep learning based edge video analytics. I will show you how to design an efficient, uh, you know, video analytics system uh, at the edge for, you know, for this kind of uh, workloads. And uh, finally, I will uh, discuss a little bit uh, my vision towards general purpose edge AI systems. Uh, I will discuss uh, what are the challenges there and what are the you know future directions and that uh, we need to look at in order to achieve this uh, this vision. Uh, so, because I don't think we have a large group here, so if you have any questions uh, in the middle, please feel free to type in uh, in the chat and then so I can answer them, or you can raise your hand. Uh, if you want, uh, ask your question, and then we can discuss. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. So let's move on to mobile computation of loading. So to understand uh, uh, why this thing happens, uh, we need to understand uh, a little bit more. You know, the evolution of the mobile devices in the beginning of the twenty first century, right? So. If you if you uh, know a little bit, uh, you know the, uh, of course I'm pretty sure everybody knows a little bit uh, this history. Basically, in the first decade of the 21st century, we have seen, you know, a very uh, dramatic uh, evolvement of mobile devices, right? From the fixed function mobile phones towards more. Uh, you know, like uh, powerful devices that can run different kinds of uh, applications. So in general, we have seen that uh, mobile devices uh, come came with larger screens, more sensors, and also they are running more sophisticated, sophisticated applications based on modern operating systems like iOS and Android operating system, right? However, there are 
uh, still bottlenecks uh, to you know mobile devices despite uh, this sort of uh, rapid evolution. So in general, we have seen a limited on-device processing power. They can run some sophisticated applications, but uh, you know usually if you if you run really intensive computation on your mobile device, uh, either you have very bad user experience or you have the battery problem there. So I think one of the papers mentioned that uh, if you run augmented reality, for instance, on your mobile phone, it will drain the battery in like one hour or two. So that is really problematic. And sadly, actually nowadays, we still see this kind of constraints, right? So that's why we still need to, you know, this problem is unsolved yet. So we still need to pay, pay attention to it. So at that time, people ask uh, the question, so can we bring network resources to, to the mobile? And uh, basically the idea is to offload the intensive computations of mobile applications to a server. This server could be in the cloud or uh, on-premise on uh, through the network, right? So imagine that you have a mobile device and then you just ask the server, can you do something for me? And then the server will, will, will tell you that, okay, this is done, here you go, right? That would be very, very cool, actually. But how can we achieve this, right? What are the uh, general approaches that we can use to, to, to achieve this, uh, uh, this vision? So there are generally two approaches. Uh, so one is, uh, I mean, in general, this uh, this is called the mobile computation uploading, right? And uh, there are two approaches. One is uh, based on the uh, client-server paradigm. So we can offload, you know, the full application or even the operating system to the server, and then we just uh, issue sort of uh, requests or uh, like screen sharing or whatever to the server, and then we can use applications, uh, you know, on the mobile device but the application or the operating system is actually run on the, on the server completely. On the other hand, we don't offload the full application. We just uh, offload uh, you know, some components of the applications uh, to the server. And for instance, here, if we use uh, uh, video streaming applications, there is a video decoder component in the application. We can just offload that part to the server because uh, somehow we believe that this is more, you know, computation intensive and uh, it will be beneficial, you know, to do this on the server instead of on the mobile phone, right? And this is uh, called uh, fine-grained uh, code offloading. So, so I will go through uh, both of them and talk about, uh, you know, the very representative works uh, in, in uh, each of the uh, of these uh, paradigms. So, for the uh, client server based paradigm, actually, there was a paper from 2009, or even a little bit earlier, there were some workshop papers on that as well. So they demonstrate uh, basically the possibility of using virtual machine to achieve uh, mobile computation uploading, right? So the, the general idea is illustrated here. So we have a mobile device, we have the, uh, you know, the, the cloud server, or a nearby server to the mobile phone, which is called the Cloudlet. And then uh, the, uh, we can run a virtual machine on this server, and then the mobile device can access the virtual machine and run applications on this virtual machine uh, for different purposes. And of course, the connection is through the wireless uh, network, right? The Wi Fi network, or at that time, I think uh, people consider the 3G networks. Uh, so, uh, basically, I mean, it, it worked somehow, but uh, there are still a, a lot of limitations of this approach. So you can use applications, but, uh, if you really use them, you will, you will notice that the, uh, user experience is, uh, really uh, not there that uh, you really want to use it. Right. So what are the limitations of this approach? I would like to, you know, uh, poke a little bit uh, on this. Uh, if if you want to speak up, you know, I want to make this interactive, right? So if, if you want to speak up, uh, feel free to do so.
Okay, so actually uh, the limitations are sort of straightforward. So because it is virtual machine based and then we know that you know to initialize the virtual machine to bring up uh, the application, actually it takes time, right? Also, you know, uh, sort of uh, you want to synthesize this virtual machine with the application you want, that takes time as well. So in general, you can expect like uh, tens of uh, tens of seconds, like even hundreds of seconds before you can actually access the virtual machine and run the application. So which is uh, uh, not really, uh, you know, friendly with uh, mobile mobile applications in general, right? And also the network connection could be unstable. So if you are walking around, you have a, you know mobility of the device, then you know the connection may be uh, you know up and down, a lot of up and down, and then you know the user experience would be really really bad because of this uh, variability of the network. And also since everything is offloaded, the operating system and the applications both are offloaded, right? So it is really inflexible. And the general question we want to ask is, do we really need to offload all of them, right? And uh, if, if not, then, you know, we may pick some parts of the applications to offload. And then the question is, would the offloading decision the same for all the devices, right? I mean, maybe the devices have different specifications and also the network bandwidth conditions are certainly uh, different for different, uh, you know, users' environments. And, uh, you know, basically with this approach, we cannot decide any of those. So even the network is really poor, you still need to, you know, access the virtual machine for the application, which, which, which is, uh, uh, you know, when the network is good, then probably this is uh, the way you want to do it. But when the network is bad, probably you don't want to do it that way. So that, that was uh, the major limitations of uh, this approach, right? So apparently people noticed uh, these uh, problems and then they uh, kept working on this and uh, they came up with uh, you know, more fine grant uh, offloading uh, schemes for mobile computing. Uh, so which is based on uh, code level uh, uh, offloading. So we can offload mobile code uh, to our server over a wireless network transparently. And here I would like to select uh, three uh, like representative works uh, in this domain. Uh, so the general idea is to you know, achieve fine grained code offloading without the programmer involvement because we have all kinds of uh, mobile applications developed already. So if you come up with an offloading scheme that requires you to modify all the applications, it will be a lot of overhead, right? So it would be very cool if we can do this kind of things transparently without uh, you know, programmable, uh, programmable uh, uh, involvement. And why we want to do uh, offloading here? So in general, we can optimize uh, uh, different kinds of things like execution time, uh, memory, disk, or energy consumption of the mobile device, right? We can you know, optimize different things and uh, I think execution time and energy were the most uh, uh, intensively explored uh, objective there. And we will use the of, of, uh, execution time, for example, to demonstrate you know, those different uh, approaches. So the first work uh, in this direction is called Maui, and it aims to achieve highly transparent code offloading while uh, method level migration. So how does it do it? So imagine that you have a, a mobile application uh, that runs in a single process, and then you have a threads, you know, uh, doing doing the real computation, uh, you know, performing the, the methods in your application, right? And uh, basically, you design a Mavi design a, a runtime framework where you know you have a client proxy, which takes care of the, the execution environment, also the method invocation. And then you have a profiler to you know, profile the, the cost of uh, the execution. And then you have a solver to decide if you want to offload or not. And on the server side, uh, it's more or less the same. So there is a runtime environment to support these kind of things. And there are 
uh, three major challenges to address here. First, uh, you know, the mobile device and the server uh, could have uh, different, uh, you know, instruction set architectures, ISAs, right? So the mobile device may be uh, usually based on ARM based uh, ARM architecture, and then the server is uh, x86. So how to you know uh, deal with the different ISAs when you offload the code? And the second one is program state management. So when you offload the method to the remote server, for instance, then probably the method involves some sort of state there. You want to migrate the state uh, to the server. And then once the method is done, you want to migrate back uh, the state. And finally, how to decide uh, when to offload and when not to offload, right? So we need uh, some sort of decision making there. And in Malvi, uh, they came up with uh, uh, several designs to address uh, those challenges. Uh, so first, before we can offload the code, we need to understand, you know, which part of the code of the application we want to offload, right? And in Mavi, actually, this is done manually by programmer. So basically, uh, we ask the programmer to annotate the methods and classes that can be executed remotely. For instance, here, we have uh, several uh, methods in one application. We have a display, we have a read GPS, or we have a video decoder, for instance. And then here we decide to uh, make uh, this method the video decoder to be uh, uh, remote, uh, to me to be remotable, meaning that uh, you know at runtime maybe we want to offload this uh, method to the uh, remote server, right? So we put a uh, annotation to this uh, method, and then for those uh, uh, remotable uh, methods. Uh, the Maui framework basically uh, generates some sort of uh, method uh, wrapper to to the uh, to the methods. Uh, and there are there are two things uh, we need to mention here. First is the uh, parameter, uh, the argument that we want to pass to the uh, method. In addition to the method, the parameters for the method itself, we also pass the application state to the uh, remote server because uh, this method may modify the state uh, during execution, right? And then another thing to mention here is the return. Uh, so once the execution is done, uh, the method may modify the state and then we want to return this state to the mobile device so that uh, the mobile device can continue its execution. Uh, so this is more about state management. And then uh, at runtime, there is a decision engine to make offloading decisions. Uh, how to do that? So basically uh, at compile time, Malvi extracts the states uh, associated to each of the uh, uh, remotable methods. And then it profiles those uh, methods to estimate the cost of, uh, of the execution. And then based on this cost function, it solves an optimization problem to decide uh, whether it would be beneficial to offload this method to the remote server or not. So here you can, you can see that uh, the programmer's involvement is really minimized, but uh, still there, right? So programmer's involvement is still needed because uh, we need uh, the programmer to annotate uh, the source code which is uh, not so nice. Uh, and uh, there are other papers uh, uh, that, that, that aimed to address this problem we will discuss. So here is the general workflow of Maui. Uh, so first we, we do the profiling for the device, for the program and for the network, right? And then after that, we run an optimizer to determine the offloading decisions to see if we want to really offload uh, you know, the method to the remote server based on the network condition or the battery condition of the, of the device. And then after that, if we decide to offload this method, we serialize uh, the state uh, and then hand over the control to the, to the remote server. And then the remote server will uh, start uh, the execution. After that, uh, it returns the control uh, to the mobile device and send back the state. 
So here, uh, remember that we mentioned one of the challenges is about uh, the uh, ISA differences between the mobile device and the server. And uh, actually the uh, sort of worked around this problem by building on top of application level virtual machines like Java virtual machine. And this is a really highly controlled uh, runtime environment. So you can do uh, you know, uh, many, many things there without uh, uh, concern, being concerned uh, of the uh, instruction uh, set architectures. Uh, however, there is one limitation is that, you know, MOVI does not support multi-threaded applications. So if you have one thread uh, executing different methods, then you can do this kind of things. But if you have a concurrent thread, threads running, you know, inside this application, then uh, it does not support it. So that's why uh, Clone Cloud is the, another uploading mobile computation uploading system, which wants to go uh, one step further. So it, it basically uh, addresses two problems of uh, Maui. One is uh, the programmer involvement. We said in Maui, actually, we need the programmer involvement for annotating the source code. But Clone Cloud, Clone Cloud wants to remove that part, right? So it wants to achieve automatic thread level mobile code of migration without programmer involvement. Uh, the general architecture is very similar to Maui, I would say. And uh, we have the, uh, you know, the uh, application level virtual machine and uh, the runtime. Uh, you know, we have the decision engine profiler, whatever. And uh, basically we run everything on virtual machine, right? And uh, so in this case, actually, uh, Clone Cloud supports for you know optimistic uh, concurrency. So it does not support uh, you know complete uh, concurrent uh, thread execution, but it supports uh, uh, to an extent, to some extent. So if the threads that do not involve offloaded states uh, on the mobile device, then they can continue. So imagine that we have multi threads. And some of the threads do not need to modify or read or write uh, whatever the, you know, the uh, state that have been uploaded to the uh, to the server. Then they can continue locally. Otherwise, they have to to be blocked and wait until the the state uh, is uh, updated by the server. So, how to remove the uh, uh, programmer involvement? So basically, the Clone Cloud used a very straightforward approach. Uh, uh, we can use a static uh, code analysis to uh, automatically identify you know, the migration and reintegration points in the code. Uh, for example, we have uh, this class C here. It includes uh, three functions. And then we have the entry points here. So after the static program analysis, actually, we can generate uh, a static control flow graph for this uh, for this uh, application. Of course, this is approximate because uh, in general this is a hard problem, right? And then uh, basically after that we can decide, okay, what are the uh, methods that we want to offload, uh, and what are the methods that we want to you know run locally on the mobile device. Uh, based on that, we can partition the application, right? So. And another problem here is uh, how to decide, uh, you know, when to offload and when not to offload. So we need some sort of a cost model for that. Uh, so Clone Cloud uh, used the application profiling to generate uh, something called the profile, profile trees for mobile applications. Uh, and this tree is generated for both the mobile device and uh, the, the server. Uh, the main idea is that we can, you know, for instance, here we use execution time as an example. So we can uh, build the cost, uh, the, the, the different costs, like the execution time of the different methods inside the application with this uh, sort of a tree architecture here. And then we put uh, the execution time as the cost of the node and then put the migration cost uh, as the cost on the edges. And then at the end, we can decide, you know, uh, where to partition this graph so that we can get the uh, minimal cost of the whole system. 
And uh, Tom Cloud actually used the randomly chosen set of input data uh, to, you know, to, to do this uh, sort of uh, profiling. So, yeah, we, we mentioned that, okay, we can now with Clown Cloud, we can actually automatically uh, decide, you know, uh, uh, which methods to offload, which part of the applications to offload and, uh, you know, how to, to offload, but uh, it does not uh, really support multi-threaded applications, right? So that's why uh, Comet uh, actually went uh, one step further on top of that. So it aims to achieve sub method level migration and multi-thread support uh, using distributed shared memory. Uh, so the general architecture is like this. So we have mobile devices, we have uh, uh, the operating system running on the mobile device, right? And on top of that, we have applications. So basically we introduce distributed memory synchronization here uh, so that we can you know, synchronize the memory state uh, between the mobile device and uh, the server so that the applications can have a common uh, memory space uh, across the two uh, so that we can run, you know, multiple threads uh, for the application across the, the, the two sides. And uh, I'm not gonna, you know, uh, go deeper into this uh, uh, paradigm because uh, distributed shared memory is very well uh, started, uh, you know, uh, technology in uh, cluster computing environment. If you want, you can, you know, check uh, uh, books or papers about those. So the general idea is that we have different multiple nodes, and then all of them have uh, uh, some memory, right? And then, you know, basically we want to map those memory to all uh, shared memory space where the applications running on those nodes will have a common view of this, uh, you know, shared memory space. Of course, the major challenge here is uh, how to maintain the memory consistency here because you may have uh, uh, memory copies across different nodes uh, that you want to you know, make sure that uh, those, those are consistent when you read or write uh, those memory, right? So in uh, Comet, actually they used a very simple, straightforward, the lazy release consistency model, model there. And the general idea is, uh, for instance, uh, here is a, is a simple example. So we have uh, multiple threads within one application. We have two endpoints here, right? So here, uh, let's see the uh, bus. Oh, sorry. So the bus uh, thread is ex executing and it wants to modify the, ver the variable x, uh, assign one to x, and then uh, we have a another concurrent thread bar, uh, which is also executing. And then at a certain point, we want to offload this uh, uh, thread to the remote server endpoint two. And then basically we migrate this uh, method, but at the same time, we also uh, move the state like the heap uh, with uh, this uh, variable X. And then we also move the stack of the two uh, uh, threads to a uh, remote server and then continue the execution of bar there, right? At a certain point, we may want to lock, uh, lock something uh, in the, in a, like a shared uh, variable in the code, and then we can apply lock there. So we assign the owner of the lock to the uh, endpoint two to the server, and then we do the execution whatever. And then after that, uh, we can, you know, release the lock and put the owner of the log to uh, endpoint one again, so that uh, you know the the best uh, thread can modify uh, the ver the variables again. And uh, of course, so in the meantime, we have another thread which is executing on the server, which modifies some of the variables, and then we also update this state to you know to the uh, mobile phone endpoint one. And uh, so on and so forth. Yeah. So the idea is really straightforward. But at the end, what we can achieve is a uh, uh, seamless, uh, you know, offloading of uh, of threads uh, to the server in multi-threaded uh, mobile applications. So yeah, that is quite cool, right? So 
actually the technology is there and uh, you know we can why so if you look at mobile devices nowadays we actually we are not using this kind of technologies right uh, so in that sense it did not really fly so what are the issues there that uh, you know uh, prevented uh, this technology from uh, widespread uh, uh, adoption so if you look a little bit closer, actually, there are a lot of issues here. First is, you know, uh, we need uh, operating system support for this kind of technologies, right? So we said that we don't want to modify the applications, that is nice. But uh, all the frameworks we have seen, like uploading frameworks, they have to be uh, deployed on the operating system uh, so that, you know, they can support this kind of uh, uploading strategies, whatever. And this is in general against the device maker's interest, right? So like the mobile phone manufacturers, they really want to you know, make uh, expensive phones that are more powerful or whatever, uh, so that they can, you know, they can gain um, uh, benefits from that. But if you say that you can upload everything to the, to the server, at the end, the mobile device is just a dumb device, then it is uh, sort of against their interest. And the second thing is, uh, we don't have a very good support for, you know, for the server and also the network. So imagine you want to offload something, right? Ideally, you would like the server to be close to your mobile phone so that you have uh, low latency. Uh, if, if you do everything in the cloud, then, you know, the, the internet, uh, over the internet, the latency could be uh, very high and also very variable. So in that sense, uh, this, this kind of things may, may, may never fly because of that sort of variable latency, right? And uh, network support is also a little bit weak. At that time, we only had a 5G, uh, no, 3G networks. So many of the studies actually showed that, uh, you know, it is not beneficial at all if you use a 3G network to do this kind of uploading. And Wi-Fi was, was considered, you know, a, a better choice there, but, uh, of course, that's, that's not enough for, you know, mobile devices. And uh, it is sort of a chicken egg problem. So if there is no application, then no deployment of the infrastructure. If there is no deployment of the infrastructure, then not so many people will be interested in developing applications in that direction, right? And also the complexity is still there. Uh, so we need to consider like practical issues like mobility. So all the solu solutions we have uh, discussed actually they consider a static uh, case where you have a mobile phone, you have a network, static network, and then you have the server. But what if you are moving around? Then you need to deal with the handover, you know, all sorts of uh, complexity there, right? And finally, uh, actually the gain from this kind of uh, uh, solutions. Uh, is uh, very unclear in practical scenarios. So if you check the papers, actually, uh, most of them are based on handcrafted uh, applications or very carefully selected applications that could potentially gain from this kind of offloading. But uh, you know, in in real world scenarios, if you talk about uh, you know the applications we have on App Store or whatever. Actually, the game is, is very unclear, especially when we are facing uh, very challenging networking environments. So those are the major uh, reasons behind, uh, you know, uh, that those uh, offloading techniques uh, didn't uh, really fly in the past. But uh, some of the designs actually uh, have been adopted in current mobile applications, uh, sort of in an implicit way like for instance Siri, right, on, on iPhones, uh, they used uh, this kind of offloading idea for the complex uh, natural language processing component. So basically that is done uh, on, their, on their servers, right? So they don't do this complex, you know, code uh, uh, or thread level offloading, of course, but uh, they offload some of the major components to, uh, to the cloud in order to address the uh, computational issue on the on the mobile phone. So uh, that's about uh, mobile computation of loading, and uh, I yeah I think that that was the you know major uh, development in uh, 
edge computing domain. At that time, uh, you know, people were mainly focused on mobile applications. Uh, so a lot of attention have been paid on that. But nowadays, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, more uh, applications, more and more applications that, that fall into a certain category, which is called, uh, you know, deep learning based uh, inference applications. And in particular, uh, we have seen a lot of applications that are based on video analytics. So the general idea is that you have a camera or a video source that, and then you want to apply some uh, you know, uh, complex analytics on the video to understand what's going on inside the video, right? And uh, usually you apply you know, deep learning methods on, on the video to do the analytics. And uh, this has been considered the killer application for edge computing. So basically uh, people have found that uh, for those kind of applications, maybe offloading the deep learning part to a, a server would be very much uh, you know, beneficial. Just as the Siri example we have, we have talked about. So as we know, we have uh, different applications, right? That are heavily, uh, you know, deployed uh, based on deep neural networks for inferencing uh, over the video streams. Uh, for instance, we have cameras that are capturing the, you know, the wildlife to learn about their habits. Uh, and also we have a traffic cam at the, uh, on the road, right, at the uh, cross of the roads to analyze uh, the traffic flow or to monitor the traffic conditions. Or we have like a drone cameras that uh, that are used to estimate the number of objects, like uh, in a parking uh, parking lot, something like that, right? Uh, so in general, uh, inside of those applications, uh, the most computation intensive part is the deep neural network execution, right? So the the inference part using deep neural networks, and in terms of both latency and energy consumption, uh, of course. And this leads to re reconsideration of uh, computation offloading. Basically, maybe we don't need to offload you know, uh, at the code level, but instead, if we offload this uh, most computation intensive part in the application, then you know, since we also have uh, uh, more uh, powerful mobile devices nowadays, probably that's sufficient enough for many of the mobile applications on the market. So how to support this kind of applications, uh, you know, uh, on the, uh, the uh, computing paradigms we have, we have mentioned. So basically there are two general approaches. We can do on-device computing where we can use a lightweight deep neural network uh, to, you know, analyze the video stream and then, you know, take actions locally based on the analytics results. So of course, this is very nice. So it has low latency and low network traffic and also high reliability, right? But uh, on the other hand, since we cannot really deploy the state-of-the-art uh, DNA models on those devices, uh, many times we end up with uh, suboptimal analytics accuracy. On the other hand, we can use a platform-based approach where we can actually employ the most sophisticated uh, DNNs for the analytics, right? Uh, platform by platform, I mean, either it is uh, the cloud server or it is a uh, sort of an edge server deployed, you know, at the uh, close to the end devices. So, of course, we gain high analytics accuracy because we are using state-of-the-art models. On the other hand, uh, you know, it, it provides very high latency because of the network involvement and also high network traffic there. So uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, either of these uh, uh, approaches has a lot of work there. And uh, in the, you know, in the other lectures later today or tomorrow, they will talk about uh, how to do on device learning, these kind of things. But uh, today we are going to focus on the platform based approach where how we can overcome the problem, you know, or the limitation of the of the variability of the network. So, so the problem is that we have high network variability, 
this is mainly caused by uh, device mobility or the interference of the wireless uh, signals, right? So this is uh, uh, some data uh, actually we collected uh, on our Wi-Fi network. So we consider two different scenarios. One is a static scenario and another is mobile scenario. And uh, we measure the, the bandwidth of the network uh, across time, uh, you know, in under this uh, different scenarios. So we can see that uh, we have a lot of variability here, especially when the device is mobile. And uh, the difference between the, you know, the highest bandwidth uh, and the lowest bandwidth could be like 10 times uh, or even more. So even when the device is static, we also see a lot of uh, variability there. So the question is, if we really want to offload uh, the video analytics to a platform over a wireless network, like a Wi-Fi network, right? How to handle such kind of high variability? And uh, so in the literature, actually there are two general directions. Uh, one direction is called uh, system adaptation. So uh, basically we, we have a variability, network variability, and we want to handle it, how to handle it. So basically we, uh, we make the system adaptive. Uh, basically we conduct uh, trade-offs between latency and accuracy at a runtime. How to do that? Uh, because we have, uh, you know, different uh, types of uh, neural networks that can be used for the same inference task. For instance, we can have a very uh, complex, uh, you know, uh, heavy network that can provide higher accuracy. But at the same time, we have also lightweight models that, that can do the same job, but with uh, uh, lower accuracy, right? So at runtime, actually, we can switch uh, between the different models so that we can, you know, adapt the system accordingly to achieve the balance uh, uh, between uh, latency and accuracy. And uh, another dimension is the frame rate. For instance, uh, you know, we get the frame rate at uh, probably, you know, 30 or, you know, 50 or 60 frames per second, but then we can just apply the analytics to a subset of those frames at the end, we will lose some accuracy, but uh, we can, you know, uh, save some computation there so that we can uh, save some time actually, like uh, the streaming time, the computation time, so that we can meet the uh, the real time requirements, right? Even under variable network conditions. So this is about system adaptation. Another approach is called hybrid approach. So we have the device, we have the, uh, you know, the platform, the edge platform, and then we can actually try to combine the processing power uh, on the device and on the edge platform. So what about we, we do some computation locally, and then at the same time, we do some computation on the server. At the end, we combine the two to provide uh, the video analytics results, right? So, uh, uh, actually, we can, you know, either partition the DNN or use a lightweight uh, local uh, processing, like a, a small model locally, uh, you know, to provide a real-time guarantee on the, on the device. At the same time, we use the cloud processing, uh, which produces higher accuracy to help the, the uh, 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 local processing. So I think we are almost uh, at the middle of this session. I would propose to take a, a 10 minutes break. Uh, maybe you want to grab some coffee or you know, stretch your legs, whatever. And then we, we come back at, uh, uh, after 10 minutes. So for some of you probably it's like uh, 10, uh, 10, 10, 10. For me, it's like uh, four ten in the afternoon. Yeah, is that okay?
All right, see you in a bit. Yeah. I don't know, it's gonna be quicker. Let's go ahead and turn off.
All right, I think the break is over. Uh, welcome back, everyone. So let's continue with um, video stream analytics, right? So in general, you know, we have the problem of uh, uh, high network uh, variability. So we need some solutions uh, to respond to this problem. And uh, in general, there are two uh, research directions we haven't mentioned, system adaptation or hybrid approach. So let's take a look at uh, each of them uh, to see what kind of works are already there. And uh, maybe in the future, you want to work in, in these directions, right? So uh, let's first take a look at a system adaptation. So if we want to do adaptation in the system, first thing we need to understand you know, how different models uh, you know, have, uh, what kind of profiles of the different models that we have. Uh, and uh, if we do an adaptation decision, what is the consequence, right? And there are two general performance metrics we need to look at. One is uh, latency. So if we choose different model, how long does it take uh, for it to, to be executed, right? On the other hand, uh, the accuracy. So different models with different sizes, different architectures, they may have a different accuracy. So we want to understand uh, exactly the trade-off between uh, latency and the accuracy. So as we can see here that, I mean, the different uh, colors here, the different uh, uh, lines here represent the different models, basically the models of different sizes as shown on the right side. So we have different uh, size models. And then in general, we can see that the latency increases almost linearly with the DNN size. Uh, but if we look at the accuracy, actually, here we have two different uh, curves or lines uh, representing you know, the accuracy curve uh, under different video contexts. So uh, as we can see that in different video contexts, actually the accuracy shows a different uh, kind of uh, 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 trends for the, for the different size models. So in that in that sense, we need to really consider you know the the, the content of the video so that we can do uh, appropriate uh, trade-off between latency and accuracy, right? Otherwise, you may make uh, wrong uh, trade-off decisions. So that comes to the question because we mentioned that yet we have another uh, dimension which is the frame rate, which also contributes to latency and accuracy, right? So then, you know, in different video contexts, what kind of uh, techniques we should adapt, uh, we should uh, adopt? Uh, we should adapt the frame rate or we should adapt uh, the frame size or the DNN size. So let's take a look at uh, application specific solutions where, I mean, this is a, a very simple scenario where we have a surveillance application that detects pedestrians on a busy street. So let's say we have a traffic camera or whatever, looking at the, the road. And then actually, so we are looking at, at uh, basically very small targets in the very far field uh, views, right? And then after like one second or two seconds, we see very small difference of the video frames. And in this case, if we reduce the frame rate, so here, this is like 30 frames per second. This is 10%, 10 frames per second and so on and so forth. Even we have only two frames per second, in this case, the accuracy is still very high uh, because uh, you know, not so much has been changed uh, uh, in, the, in the different video frames over time. And, but on the other hand, we can save a lot of bandwidth because of this uh, reduce of the re reduction of the frame rate. So this is a good adaptation uh, solution for this scenario, right? But uh, if we try to adapt the resolution of the video frame, we will see that even you know, a little bit uh, decrease of the resolution of the video frame, we see a big drop of the, uh, of the accuracy. And of course we can save some bandwidth, but then you know, this is a, a sort of, a, uh, overrun by the uh, the accuracy drop that we can afford. So in this case, actually, this is not a good uh, adaptation uh, uh, approach. 
because simply it uh, it does not uh, really satisfy you know the optimal adaptation relationship that we want to exploit. So if we you know change to another application where where we have a you know, sort of augmented reality application where we are facing you know objects on a mobile phone for instance uh, which is uh, quite near you know the the objects are quite near to the mobile phone so we can see nearby and large targets and in this case even just after one second there is a large difference because of the camera movement or the device movement right so in this case if we adapt the frame rate we will have a serious problems because if you reduce the frame rate, actually, you know, uh, maybe you will you will be missing a lot of uh, important frames in the middle uh, because uh, the differences are quite large, right? And in this case, you save bandwidth, but the, also you uh, you lose uh, the accuracy. But if we consider uh, adapting the resolution, then actually. It doesn't really matter because uh, you know the objects are really really big there, and even if you reduce the resolution to a large extent, you still can achieve very high accuracy, uh, and at, at, at the same time you can save a lot of bandwidth, right? So this just uh, I mean the two examples just uh, show that if we basically use application specific solutions, it those solutions generalize very poorly. So you cannot use the solution for one application and apply it to another application. Maybe it will be uh, not so efficient, or it will be the least efficient uh, solution, you know, for another uh, application, right? So we need somehow to uh, come up with uh, adaptive video stream analytics, meaning that uh, we want to have automatically generated, very precise trade-off or, or adaptation policies for each application. So for each application, we could figure out, okay, uh, which adaptation policy would be the best uh, at runtime. And we want uh, to do this kind of things automatically instead of, uh, you know, uh, human uh, experts, uh, you know, trying to figure out uh, what will be the best uh, relationship there. And uh, in general, we have the two uh, metrics here. One is the latency, another is accuracy, right? We have mentioned already. So here, uh, it is basically a trade-off and we have some uh, solutions already there. Like uh, if you just uh, stream everything over UDP, you get a very uh, low latency. I mean, this is a lower, lower side, low latency, but then the fidelity or the accuracy is also lower because you may uh, you may lose a lot of packets, and then so the frames are corrupted, right? On the other hand, you can use TCP. You have very high accuracy, but then you will suffer from a lot of latency, very high latency. And at the end, we want to achieve something on this side, both low latency and high accuracy. And we want to do this automatically for uh, all kinds of applications. And this, this is basically the motivation behind the AW strain, which uh, is a paper published in 2018. So I'm going to quickly go through the, the designs of AW strain and uh, how it works, right? So there are three important components in AW strain. Uh, first, uh, from the application programming interface uh, point of view, we, we need some sort of new interface here for the programmer to specify what are the possible combinations of adaptations that can be done in this application. Because current applications actually, when you deploy, when you develop them, they do not support any adaptation decisions, right? So you have the input, a video input, uh, it comes with a resolution and then your application will deal with this uh, resolution. But uh, what, what's uh, needed is actually you know, as an application developer, you need to specify, okay, I can uh, accept, uh, you know, some sort of resolution degradation, uh, but I need to specify what, what are the degre degradation levels that I, I can accept. So AWS RAN comes with a, a sort of a 
may be operators here. So you can apply, you know, like quantization or different levels of uh, resolution frame rate uh, with uh, this sort of interface. And uh, after that, actually the system will profile uh, all these combinations of adaptation uh, decisions and then generate the bandwidth accuracy statistics for all these uh, possible combinations. And then find out the uh, Pareto optimal frontier of those uh, adaptation decisions, right? And uh, at runtime, actually, you just uh, need to measure the current network bandwidth, and then you look at this figure, uh, you know, map the bandwidth, the real time bandwidth to this figure, and then find out the uh, adaptation decision with the highest accuracy. And then you, you keep doing that, uh, you know, during uh, the runtime so that you can make sure that you always achieve the best uh, trade off between bandwidth and accuracy. So that is about adaptation. Of course, there are other papers. I don't want to you know, spend uh, too much time on that side, but uh, you know, I would like to actually talk a little bit more on the hybrid approach uh, because I also have some active work uh, in, this, uh, in this direction. Uh, so what do we mean by a hybrid approach, right? So, I mean, at a high level, we want to combine the local and the remote processing power. So we have processing power here, processing power here. Why don't we uh, leverage uh, both of them instead of uh, having just on-device computing or just the cloud computing or edge computing, right? So how to achieve that? Uh, I will basically cover three different uh, solutions. Uh, one solution is, you know, we use object tracking like a lightweight uh, mechanism on the mobile device to mask the network delay, because we, we have mentioned that, you know, the network, uh, we need time to transmit the data to the server over the network. Uh, and also this uh, delay is actually variable, right? So this could be quite problematic uh, for many of the applications. So how we can have some local mechanism on the mobile device so that we can mitigate or, you know, uh, avoid uh, this kind of uh, latency uh, uh, problems. And the second uh, solution here is to partition the deep neural network into two parts across the local and the remote. So basically uh, we have the, the complete deep neural network, but then we split it in the middle and then put part of it uh, on the mobile device and then another part uh, on, the, on the server. And finally, I would like to discuss uh, how we can remove the remote processing from the critical parts of the application. So imagine that you have a lightweight uh, uh, solution running on the mobile device to provide real-time response, but at the same time, you can get some uh, you know, help from the remote server to improve the quality. But the remote server or the network is not uh, in the critical parts of the application. So even if your network connection is lost, you can still rely on the local processing to provide, uh, to generate, uh, you know, uh, results, right? All right, so let's go through each of those uh, solutions. So the first solution is called, is called object tracking. So the idea is uh, quite uh, simple. So imagine we have a mobile application that uh, uh, requires to track objects uh, in the video frames, right? So the mobile device has a camera that is capturing the, uh, the environment with a video stream. And then you want to analyze the video stream to you know, uh, track the objects there or to identify the objects there. So of course we can do this with edge computing. So we have an edge server, we can offload everything to the edge, like the deep neural network at the edge, right? But one problem is that, uh, for instance, imagine this is a frame you send to the server. So at, at time T, you send a frame to the server, but when you get the analytics results back, actually it takes time, right? So maybe it has like a 10 millisecond or even 100 millisecond has, has passed. So when you get back the results, actually the video frame has changed. 
because at at this time uh you know you you might have moved uh, or whatever so you are not seeing the same thing in in a video frame so the analytic results are outdated they are not very useful for the current video frame anymore right so you need some sort of a mechanism to deal with this or you know your user experience would be very bad so how to do that so basically we can use uh, uh some sort of object tracking uh, with uh, optical flow in the middle. So, you know, this is a frame we send to the server, so starting point. And then this is a frame when we get the results back. And uh, there are certain certainly changes between those, those frames. There are a lot of frames that are, have passed, right? So we want to apply the analytics results, the delayed analytics results to the current frame, still in a, in a you know, uh, how to say feasible way, right? So if the if the video frame has changed completely, probably your object identification or recognition results would be useless. So how to do that? We basically apply op optical flow uh, among those uh, frames, and then we can track the movement of the objects in those frames. And when the analytic results uh, are back, we can you know correct the results with the open flow tracking. So if the objects have moved a little bit, we know how much it has it has moved, then we can correct the recognition results from the, from the server uh, using the opt optical flow information. But of course, optical flow is not uh, really uh, cheap, right? It takes time to do the computation locally as well. So you cannot do that for all the frames. So you can just uh, select, you know, a couple of frames or a subset of the frames and do the optical flow across those frames so that you can roughly track the movement movement of the objects. And uh, this is the idea of object tracking. So it, it basically involves some local computation to uh, mask the, uh, the uh, processing delay uh, from the remote server, right? But still, it does not solve the critical path problem. So basically, if this this uh, uh, the server the results from the server is delayed by like one second or something like that, then this will not work because the op optical flow will not be able to track, you know, uh, this kind of big changes in the in the in the video frames, right? Maybe the objects have been changed completely, so you know it, it doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, another solution is uh, called DM partitioning. Uh, so basically, we, as I said already, so we partition the DM into two parts. Uh, one part running on the device, on the mobile device, another part running on the edge server. So the idea is very simple, right? So we just cut the DM into two parts at a certain layer and then deploy it, right? And then we pass the intermediate data uh, across the network uh, from the mobile device to the to the edge server, and then the analytic results will be returned to the mobile device at the end. So here, uh, the the major challenge here is how to select the partition point. You can partition from the very beginning, from the very end, or in the middle, anywhere, right? So you need to optimize uh, uh, towards uh, some sort of performance metrics. Uh, to make the partition decision. So here you can, you can aim for low latency. For instance, you do the partition so that, uh, you know, the local processing plus the network transmission plus the server processing, uh, the delay, the overall delay is minimized. You can do that. Or you want to minimize the energy consumption on the mobile phone, right? So you can, you know, use, uh, different uh, metrics, performance metrics as the optimization goal to decide where to cut the DAM. And how to do that? You need to profile uh, the different layers in the DAM uh, network. And then based on that, you, you know, apply some sort of cost model on that and then uh, uh, make uh, the partition decision. So still, the remote component is in the critical path, right? So basically, this part is critical for your application. So if uh, there is a huge delay, 
on the network or on this part, then your application, you know, will will suffer from a poor performance, very high delay, right? So we still need some sort of adaptation here. So if the network situation changes, then we may want to reconsider the partition point so that we can still optimize for you know low latency or low energy consumption. So that this has to be done at runtime adaptively. And uh, of course, we can try to improve this solution a little bit by incorporating something called uh, early access. So I'm not a machine learning expert, so not really into this kind of uh, techniques. But uh, at a high level, the idea is like, you know, instead of uh, having one exit point of the deep neural network at the end, so we can insert some sort of intermediate uh, access, uh, exit points. So uh, it's like, uh, you know, even before you reach the end of the DAN, you can exit from, uh, from the middle layer uh, if uh, it satisfies your requirements already, like the accuracy requirement is already satisfied, then you can quit the uh, DNA execution from the middle. And uh, the system can basically choose the early exit points according to the environmental conditions, like the network condition, local processing condition, remote processing condition, right? So this way, actually the remote com component is sort of out of the critical path because if you have a very bad network connection, probably you, you don't want to reach the server at all, then you can choose the exit point you know, on the local device side so that uh, you can have a really real-time response, right? And uh, the third solution uh, is called uh, fusion. And uh, the basic idea is, can we use a lightweight uh, local DNN for fast response? And then we also employ a heavy DNN uh, at the server. Uh, and uh, we try to fuse the remote results from the server with the local ones to improve accuracy. So the idea is that we, always have real-time response from the local DNN, but uh, with the help of the remote uh, results, we can improve the accuracy of the local results. So if we can do that, that would be very nice because the network is out of the critical path. At the same time, we can leverage the benefits of uh, uh, both the local processing and the remote processing, right? And this, uh, we did this paper you know, like two years ago and it was published uh, at last year's uh, SEC conference. Uh, let me just uh, briefly go through the general idea. So how to achieve this kind of fusion uh, methods. So the main motivation is to leverage the temporal correlation in the video data. So through some experiments, we noticed that the video streams actually, they have a very significant temporal correlations across the video frames. Uh, for instance, the same content, object, action, whatever may last uh, over multiple frames. So it's not like every frame is different, right? So maybe uh, during two or three seconds, you have uh, video frames that are very similar to each other. There are some uh, temporal correlations there. And also if we consider, you know, modern analytics tasks like uh, action recognition, where usually we don't, uh, use the one frame as the input. Instead, we use a, win a window of frames as the input. So in that case, actually, if you move the window, you will have overlapping frames between the different windows. And in this case, uh, you also introduce some sort of uh, you know uh, temporal correlation there, right? So this is our experiment. So we we did there. So we choose a, a window size of uh, 16 frames, and then we do the the sliding window. Uh, with uh, with a certain stride. So here, I mean, those, this is uh, the stride, basically the distance between the different windows uh, reflecting the, uh, the overlapping, number of overlapping frames, uh, you know, uh, between the different windows. And as we can see that over time, uh, we see a very strong correlation between the windows and uh, uh, basically 
even with a distance of like nine or 10, we still have uh, some uh, temporal correlations that we can leverage across the different windows. And uh, based on that motivation, uh, observation, actually we designed a system called Clownfish, which is a hybrid system for real-time video analytics across the device and the edge or cloud. So this is the general system uh, architecture. So we have the, on the local side, we have, uh, you know, uh, optimized DNN uh, running for providing uh, real-time responses. And then we have, uh, we send some of the windows, uh, you know, the frame, video frames uh, to the remote side, which runs a complete DNN there uh, and generate results. And at the end, we have a fusion uh, component to fuse the local result with the uh, remote results to generate the final results. So the two, I mean, there are two challenges here. One is how to combine the device local analytics results with the remote results, right? How to efficiently do that. And the second challenge is uh, the filter part. So basically what are video frames to send to the, to the, to the edge or to the cloud uh, to achieve bandwidth savings. So you cannot send everything there because uh, otherwise you will uh, you know, experience congestion issues, for instance, if you don't have enough bandwidth. So you have to be selective there. What video frames to send to the server so that when you fuse the results of those uh, frames uh, or of those windows, you will get the highest uh, accuracy gain. Uh, so to address those challenges, actually Clownfish features uh, those different components. So we have a window manager, which generates the video frames to send to the, uh, to the edge or to the cloud. And then we have a you know, local component I mentioned already, which runs uh, optimized the DNN. And then we have the filter, which selects the windows. And then we have the fusion component. And on the server side, we just run a completed DNN model. So for challenge one, how to fuse the results, uh, we uh, came up with a lightweight method that runs on the device for the fusion uh, based on the very simple technique called the exponential smoothing, right? And uh, the most important uh, thing in the exponential smoothing approach is to decide the weight. So basically we are trying to uh, integrate the, the, you know, the remote results and uh, the local results. And uh, we want to assign a weight there to decide how much uh, we should consider from the remote one, how much we should consider from the local one. And we have to, to decide that. So we'll talk about that later, but uh, apart from that, uh, based on this uh, exponential smoothing approach, uh, we have two main procedures here. So one is called uh, fuse. So we have the local inference results, which is real-time results. And then we have our state uh, we, we, we keep in the system uh, and then at runtime, basically we fuse the two results and then produce the analytics results. Uh, and uh, another procedure is to maintain the state. So how to maintain this state, right? So the main issue is that uh, when we get the remote results, actually the result is outdated because it takes time to send the, the video frames to the server and then do the analytics there and then come back. So when it comes back, the result is outdated already, right? It's not real time. So we have to somehow integrate the outdated results to the current state so that you know, uh, the, the results still uh, can help uh, to improve the accuracy of the of, of, of the uh, final analytic, uh, analytic results. So how to do that? We used uh, 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 something called correlation estimation. So we want to uh, basically identify if the remote results, out, outdated the remote results are still uh, you know, close to what, what, what we want to get at this moment. So if they are really outdated, then we should abandon them instead of integrating them into the, the current uh, local results, right? So how to decide, you know, if uh, they are, how, how 
up, outdated they are. So we can define a similarity score between the consecutive windows. And then if we have high score, it means that the correlation is very high. We can still integrate the results into the current uh, prediction. Otherwise, you know, the correlation is too low, then probably we don't want to take uh, too much into account from the remote results. And uh, how to uh, obtain this uh, similarity score? We tried different approaches like uh, cosine similarity, uh, Euclidean uh, distance, whatever, but they didn't show very, very uh, uh, high accuracy at all. So at the end, we came up with a learning based approach where we take the feature vectors from the local model, local DNNs, and then we fit them into a small neural network at the end, it generates a similarity score. And uh, actually we show that this is a very efficient uh, because the network neural network is very small. So it runs very fast. And at the end, it gives a very good similarity scores. So the second challenge is about uh, filtering. So uh, basically we need to decide when to send video frames, uh, frame windows to the remote edge or the cloud server. So basically we adopt a very simple approach, which is uh, based on video context. So there are two things we do here. One is when we identify there is a context uh, transition. So from one context to another context, uh, we uh, basically we send the window to the to the server because this is a very important point because the previous uh, uh, windows are not relevant for the uh, for the current window anymore. So we need to send uh, the video frame to the to the remote. And how to identify the context? We use the similarity score and put a threshold there to determine the the different contexts. And then within the same context, we just uh, periodically send uh, the, the windows to the remote server. And this frequency can be tuned based on the bandwidth, uh, bandwidth condition. If you have a very good bandwidth, you can do this more frequently. Otherwise you can do it less frequently, right? So some uh, results highlights. So uh, at the end, we look at two things. One is the analytics accuracy. Another is the throughput. So if we look at the uh, accuracy, if we you know, run the DNN, the high-end DNN on the device, and this is a DNN that we could run on the device in real time, the best DNN we can run in real time on the device. And we can see that for action recognition, the uh, top one accuracy is like uh, 51%. If we use the state-of-the-art model in the cloud, we can achieve like, uh, around 59%. But with uh, Clownfish, uh, as you can see that under different bandwidth conditions, uh, we can achieve a much higher accuracy than the local one. So a lot of improvements, especially when you have a very good bandwidth condition, you can achieve a comparable accuracy to uh, that you, you can achieve uh, in the cloud. And uh, another thing is about throughput. So basically, if we run everything on the device, of course, we can guarantee real time. So the throughput is really high. And uh, if you do everything on the edge of the cloud, then you have the network problem there. So if you have a network bandwidth drops, then the throughput will drop as well. But with Clownfish, we can guarantee real time, uh, high throughput all the times, and also very high accuracy as shown on the left. So that's about, uh, uh, fusion. So we have talked about basically three different approaches for hybrid uh, deployments of, of uh, video analytics uh, applications, right? We talk about uh, object tracking. We talk about uh, DM partitioning, early access, and also we talk about fusion. So now let's move on to some other research directions. In general, I would like to give you some sort of uh, my, my vision for general purpose edge AI systems. So what kind of systems we really want to build in future to support different kinds of uh, AI applications at the edge. And of course, this is an open, I mean, uh, area and there are many open questions to answer. So, you know, it's just uh, my personal opinion uh, for this direction. 
All right. So we have talked about the modern distributed computing continuum, right? Uh, we have the cloud, we have the devices, and now we also have the edge, edge layer. Uh, so there are some very basic questions that we need to answer uh, in order to, in order to you know, make edge computing actually general purpose, right? So we don't want to have uh, specialized assistance here and there for every different application. What we want is we have a general purpose platform where you can develop uh, all different kinds of uh, uh, edge applications and you can run them uh, directly on this platform on demand, right? It's, it's, it's very much similar to the cloud computing idea where we want to have a general purpose solution there, right? So in order to achieve that vision, we have three major things that we need to consider. So one is uh, uh, how to deal with the storage. So we need we have a lot of data, right? And the data come from the different devices at the edge uh, on the devices. And then how to store this data on this uh, edge continuum so that we can use them in an efficient way. And the second one is uh, resource management. So how to manage the distributed resources here. And then finally, we need to deal with uh, programming. So how to uh, program uh, your edge applications in a very uh, convenient way so that the application can run uh, at the different uh, layers or places, right? All right. So let's quickly go, go through uh, each of them. And then uh, at the end, I will uh, conclude. So for edge storage system, actually we have seen that many of the edge applications actually are collaborative, meaning that you know, it's not like one device uh, using the edge to do some processing. It's more like uh, multiple endpoints, multiple clients, they have to work together on something like augmented reality, for instance, there is a social network inside, right? So they have to interact with each other or other applications like uh, federated learning, for instance, you have uh, distributed endpoints you know, at the edge. So at the end, you need to share some state across the different endpoints and uh, how to share this uh, state efficiently. So we need a story system, right? And uh, if we follow the general principle of uh, modern computing, we want to decouple the compute and the storage uh, using paradigms like uh, serverless computing. And the general idea is that you have a computing request and then the, you know, they are issued on a uh, server as uh, stateless functions. And then you have a backend storage service, which is used uh, to synchronize your application state or data. But I mean, this is a uh, quite uh, uh, mature for cloud platforms because we have a uh, so many different storage systems designed for, for the cloud environment already. But so what about the edge, right? So if, can we apply the same thing to the edge? The short answer is of course, no, because there are many new challenges at the edge. For instance, we have more distributed environment, more heterogeneous environment and more dynamic environment, right? And basically because of those, we have a very high latency if, if we want to achieve strong consistency between the different endpoints. And also we have a very high cross-site traffic volume on the network. So we want to uh, overcome those problems uh, in the story system for that. So if we look a little bit further uh, in this direction, then we can identify the requirements for edge storage systems. Uh, I'm not gonna go through those, but uh, in general, you know, we want to achieve a lot of uh, properties, new properties for edge storage. And if we look at the current uh, literature, we will find that you know, there are at least uh, two or three of the features that are not very well supported by the current storage systems yet. And that is the motivation behind uh, uh, Griffin which is a multi-consistency hierarchical distributed storage service for edge computing. And we want to have a declarative API to support uh, multi-consistency. And also we want to incorporate a model-based uh, resource management component 
to manage the data placement. And also we want to have a real-time monitoring uh, so that we can handle mobility, uh, these kind of things. And uh, we published a vision, a vision paper uh, last year uh, for, for this uh, Griffin design. And the second topic is about uh, resource management. So basically, uh, if we look at the edge network, we have a different uh, uh, computing resources, like distributed computing resources in the network, right? And then we have the collaborative applications. Uh, they have a different computation entities that they want to, to be deployed on the edge resources. Then the question is how to map those uh, computing entities to the computing resources in an efficient way so that we can you know, optimize the, the, the system performance. So, uh, Pradeep, can you? Okay, yeah, good. So to uh, address this issue, we basically provide a cost model for the edge network. And then you know, we formulate the problem. We come up with uh, a sort of a, a efficient algorithm based on something from the computer vision community, which is called the expansion move. So we start from an initial placement of the entities, service entities, and then you know, we iterate uh, over and over uh, to refine the placement. At the end, we can achieve very good placement. And uh, the expansion move actually can be uh, solved by you know, a graph cast problem. So basically we can transform the expansion move problem to uh, a narrow flow problem and then by applying the max you know max flow algorithm on the graph then we can generate the place, placement decisions and uh, of course there are other challenges in edge resource management you want to deal with workload mi migration for instance when you have mobile devices right so finally uh, we want to provide uh, a uh, high level programming model for edge applications. Uh, why? Because if you look at the current IoT application development paradigm, actually we have different entities involved. We have the IoT sensor, we have the cloud, we have the mobile, right? If you want to develop an application for this environment, you need to decouple the logic uh, across the different devices and then write code for each of them. At the end, you chain the the you know sort of uh, the uh, different components together for your application, right? So this is a really uh, not so in, uh, convenient uh, because you have to manually partition the application. You have to understand how to you know write codes for each of the different platforms. So a new a better uh, you know program model would be to have an edge-centric view. So basically you write code in a high level language and then the compiler can take care of the partitioning of the, you know, of the computation uh, of the code to the different uh, platforms and then compile the code into the native code on the different devices or different platforms, right? So you don't need to un understand actually, you know, how to program for each of the uh, platforms, but instead you just write your code at a high level, and then there is a programming system which takes care of all the, uh, you know, the compilation and the transformation. And there are, of course, many challenges here, like uh, heterogeneity here, distributed state management, and also resource scheduling. Some of them I have discussed already in the previous uh, uh, slides. Uh, that's about general purpose edge computing, uh, the directions that uh, we really want to go. And uh, to summarize, basically today we discussed uh, the proliferation of modern mobile ubiquitous applications. And then that is basically behind the motivation of uh, modern distributed computing continuum. And then we talk about the evolution of uh, edge computing, right? We talk about uh, mobile computation offloading and the different uh, solutions for mobile code uploading. And we also talk about the killer application for edge computing. Uh, basically there are two general approaches to deal with the network variability issue. Uh, one is system adaptation and the other is a hybrid approach. 
Uh, at the end, we talk about the vision for general purpose edge computing, where we talk about the story system, cost management, and uh, programming models. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, conclude this uh, lecture and thank you very much for your attention. We still have some time for questions. So yeah, please uh, ask your question if you have any. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, Ayesha. Hi. Um, Hi. I want to ask, like, uh, in these slides, you mentioned that uh, if we partition the DNN uh, mm -hmm. at five layer, so that has low latency. I was wondering, like, what is the reason behind it? So uh, there are several reasons there. So basically, if you if you do everything locally, then you know you are bounded by the computing power of the local device, right? But uh, if you offload some of the computation to uh, the cloud with accelerators, then you can gain some uh, 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 gain some time there, because the the accelerators are more uh, powerful than your local mobile device, so they can execute the neural network uh, much faster, right? But of course, you still have the network overhead there. So you need to transmit the intermediate results uh, uh, over the network. That could be some overhead there. So, but as long as uh, the execution, the gain you, you, you get from the you know, uh, uh, execution on the, on the server side uh, is higher than the overhead you have on the network, then you gain time, right? You gain, uh, you reduce the latency, overall latency. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Professor? Uh, yes, please. I, I wonder to know in the part of fusion, have you designed mm -hmm. a system to compare the performance with the clone fish? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so uh, you design a system better than the clone fish. I, 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 I try to understand, is, is that true? Uh, so uh, our system is called clone fish, right? Clone fish is the system we designed, yeah. Oh, but why in the compare part, you also have the clone fish and the Yes, and the edge and crow. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between the crawfish and the edge and crow? <laughs> sure. So uh, edge and cloud is like uh, we offload everything to the cloud. So uh, we use a uh, high end like a uh, complex DNN uh, in the cloud for the for the uh, video analytics. Uh, Clownfish is like a hybrid approach, right? As I mentioned uh, earlier, so probably here. So it, mm -hmm. uh, we have something, you know, a small DNN locally, and then we combine the results from the edge and the cloud to improve the uh, accuracy of the analytics, but we don't rely on that for real-time response. So the edge and the cloud solution is basically the right part without the left part. So we do everything in the cloud. So that we have very high accuracy, but then we have the problem of the network, right? So if we have a low network bandwidth, then, your throughput will drop, right? Okay, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments, or you know, just feel free. If not, then I think we can conclude uh, this session now. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for your participation. I really uh, you know, enjoyed being here and uh, I hope you also uh, enjoyed uh, maybe part of, of the lecture, maybe get something useful for your studies or your research. And uh, I'm happy to discuss any research directions so my email is here. So if you are interested in some of the works I have presented, oops, you can always contact me. 
and uh, I'm very happy to discuss with you. All right, and uh, that's it. Uh, yeah, so there Hello, will Prof. be other uh, lectures. Yes. You just uh, just a little question. Like uh, here, uh, we see mostly like the uh, impact is on like you're targeting accuracy and D like DNN accuracy and the performance. How about like the uh, you, we we haven't discussed anything on the energy part like how will the uh, the impact on energy is isn't it the target like energy efficient if you want to make the system or uh, design energy efficient then mm -hmm. what kind of techniques are you uh, employing or is being employed so. I think in general, you know, uh, excursion time accuracy are the major targets right now. But there are works that are that are considering energy efficiency. For instance, I can give the example of DNN partitioning, right? So when you partition the DNN, you can optimize for low latency. So basically, the end-to-end -end latency would be your optimization goal, right? And then you can do that. On the other hand, you can do you know uh, energy optimization. So you want to choose a partition point so that the energy consumption on your mobile device is minimized. So you can, you can also do, do that. It's just a, a replacement of the, of the cost function basically, right? But uh, in, yeah, in other approaches like uh, clownfish, for instance, we didn't consider energy consumption yet because that will be uh, quite different from the latency uh, optimization. So we started from the, the goal of achieving real-time uh, video analytics, but we didn't consider energy uh, consumption. But I, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, that will be a very interesting direction to explore. We haven't done anything there yet. Okay, okay. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Yeah. So I see some uh, comments, yeah. So I hope you find uh, some of the materials helpful, right? And uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the other sessions will start in a couple of minutes, so we can stop here now. And uh, I wish you all a very nice uh, experience at uh, Embedded Systems Week and enjoy the rest of the, of the program. Thanks a lot and uh, have a nice day, bye-bye.